Hey, I'd like to pick a bone with you. <laughs> Not a fight. But we're going to go over some bones. And you're all too familiar with these. Matter of fact, there's a guy that makes a living calling himself the bone collector. And I don't want to come off rough or uh, harsh about his personality. He is what he is. I am what I am. But a uh, little more to bone collecting than antlers. Okay. Start off with all these bones you have access to. All you have to do is do a little bit more work. Uh, this complete deer skeleton is highly educational and you're going to learn something from it that you won't learn on television. This was completely scraped down as fine as I could take get it encapsulated in a cooler of rock salt for a year. When I take it out, it's all stuck together. You clean it all, all up, hit it with a light coat of bone looking paint, and you got yourself a rib cage. Matter of fact, you got the whole important anatomy of the white-tailed deer. This front part from here up would be the thoracic cavity. That's the most important that you need to know about. The anatomy of the deer. And that thoracic cavity is the most important. From here behind this purple line would be the diaphragm. Back in here is the abdominal uh, cavity. That you'll also need to know about when you go tracking up a deer because if you shoot it back here then you've got a challenge to follow up the deer. Anything forward of the diaphragm no problem. Now I learned my uh, information from Dr. John Morshello from the Arizona of Meat Science in Arizona University. So I'm, I'm talking fact, Jack. I'm just not talking my idea. Okay. The deer has 13 rib bones. They narrow at the front and they come back and they widen out for the expansion of the lungs. The bones up front are thin and wide and they're made that way to protect the heart. The heart lays down at the bottom of the brisket. Another thing people don't quite understand is the right lung has five lobes to oxygenate blood. The left lobe has three. So the to a total of eight. So if you hit it in the left lung and take the left lung out on a one lung shot, you still got the stronger lung and that can sustain life. But we're not going to get too tied up because I could go on for hours about the anatomy of that thoracic cavity. But what I'd like to talk about right now is you see the, the ideal shot is between the seventh and the third rib. That's what this little target would be about. Now a lot of you are going to notice that this target gets covered up here. This my friend is muscle. This ain't much of a muscle anymore on my 65 year old body, but if I got hit right there, it would not hit bone. It would go through soft muscle. And in my case right now, it's really soft. If you take this muscle off there, you have the scapula. If you take the muscle off down here on the humerus, these two bones, the scapula and the humerus, are the two bones that will come into play most of the time in archery. As you notice, it got quite a bit smaller. But when you put that muscle back on there, that's what gives you the definition of the V, or the aiming spot. At no time, no time, and I know a lot of guys are going to have a hard time buying into this, but this is scientific. This scapula cannot cross over and cover up the lung or the thoracic cavity at any time. It doesn't, it's it's connected to where the tenderloin area would be up on the spinal column through a, a cartilage which has no movement at all. It's soft tissue connected. All this here joint does is absorb when the deer is running. It's like a shock absorber, but it does not do this. And so many of you think what you're actually seeing is this muscle coming back here. You can shoot through that muscle. That's why the aiming spots from the third from the third rib back to the seventh. 
Same way with the humerus. The only way that that humerus bone will ever come across the heart or, or the thoracic cavity is if this humerus was broken. Then it would allow it. Even when it's laying down, it does not come across there. It's, right now, it only has a um, certain movement pattern, and unless that joint broke, it, it cannot come across this area. Now, I know that's a lot hard for you people to buy into, but here's what you're actually seeing. It's the soft tissue. This is the meat that you take off of the front shoulder section. So, that's why it's really critical to pick your aiming spot right between the third and the seventh. That gives you a, almost a two and a half inch, or yeah, two and a half, three, a three inch, three and a half inch margin of error. If you went three and a half inches here, or three and a half inches back here, you're still good to go. If you're dead center, here's what's going to happen. Bingo. Right there's a broadhead coming out of that. The broadhead coming out of that right there. As you can see, it comes right out of the heart. Uh, right on, actually, it'd be, that would be the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. That, that is the most ideal shot. And with saying that, I'm going to show you just a second. Here was the actual heart on that shot. This is the arrow. And what happened is that 2317 snapped off in the heart, coming down and broke off and stick, stuck in the heart. I couldn't figure out how my arrow was 30 inches and all of a sudden it looked like it was about 26. That's because there's a good 4 inches that went through the heart. So third and the seventh, that scapula never crosses like this. I know that's hard to buy into, but that's scientific by Dr. John Marshall out of uh, University of Arizona Meat and Science. Okay, and the humerus doesn't either. Now, those two bones come into play a lot, a whole lot. Uh, this would be the radius bone also. This would down here, the lower bone. And sometimes if you shoot for the far leg, as you notice that red area right there, that's where the broad head come out on the far leg. And, and it didn't break that, but uh, it did some damage to this lower radius bone. So those front leg bones are really, really critical. Now, on scapulas, on certain scapulas, you can actually, like this was a... a a uh, small scapula on a small deer. You can see there the hole that penetrated it. It went on through. That was like a, a yearling deer. Uh, here was one on an antelope and it, the broadhead is still in that. This was the far leg. The arrow come in from which would have been the left side and exited out through the scapula on that side. So they can be penetrated on small animals. Now this here scapula is a moose scapula and you can see the challenge of getting penetration on that. Well what I got here when I turn this around and the unique thing about a bow and arrow if you can take the same arrow and up here on the top you can see you can see a, a rabbit scapula right there. That little bitty scapula was the rabbit right there and you can kill that rabbit with this hundred grain muzzy and you can kill the same moose with that hundred grain muzzy. You cannot do that with a gun. It's going to be pretty hard. Uh, if you were going to hunt rabbit, you'd be hunting them with a 22 short, and that would be significant to kill that size. But if you went up north and tried to kill a moose with a 22 short, you would be very unethical and very unlikely that it would succumb to death. You'd need something more than a three, uh, three inch ounce uh, deer slug that we have here in Iowa. So what I'm trying to get across, the bow and arrow is so diversified that you can kill the smallest animal and the largest animal in North America with the same setup. That you go hunting the rabbit, you can take that same thing and go hunt the moose. So that's really unique about a bow and arrow. Well, you can't do that with a gun. I mean, if you shoot a rabbit with a 7mm uh, or something, uh, you're just shooting it to see if you can blow it up like a 4th, 4th of July uh, firework because there's nothing going to be edible and that's very unethical. All right, like I say, this front part is where the lungs are encapsulated. The bones between the seventh and the third is where your aiming spot is. And like I said, you can take that target, put it right on there. And I got fortunate one day to where that was an exact shot, and that brought that deer down instantaneously. Because keep in mind, the deer have to lose one third of its blood 
And now that can stay in the body or it's fall on the ground. 100 pound deer is going to have to lose somewhere in 30, about 32 ounces of blood. The bigger the deer, the more blood. That's why the bigger deer are hard, harder to follow up and find. You had a 300 pound deer, you're going to have 100 ounces of blood that's going to have to be eradicated out of the circulatory system. And like I said, we're going to go through this fairly fast because I don't want to bore you. And one other thing, while I'm talking about it, I just look down. The spinal column, this would be the spinal column for, per se. It's embedded right along the top of the vertebrae. And the thoracic vertebrae and the abdominal vertebrae. Uh, that runs the entire length. If you break that spinal column, would be broke up in the thoracic area, chances are it's going to be instantaneously death. If you break it back here, it's going to paralyze the deer and you're going to have to do a follow-up shot. It'll fall down but and it'll be paralyzed. It can't go nowhere. So if that happens, because that spinal column runs the entire length of the animal. But if it's broke up in the thoracic cavity, the deer will succumb to death almost certainly. Uh, no, but if not, just make sure you do a follow-up shot. All right, we're going to move along there. Uh, here was here was a uh, an old scapula, and you can see it's this deer didn't die. It had a wound in that scapula, and it grew back. But boy, it was a nasty wound. And I think it, the way it looked, I and I really can't say whether it was a gun or uh, an arrow that did that. But I found it dead, and it didn't die from that because you can see it actually tried to grow bone back and still had apparently lived after that shot. So even though they're shot in there sometimes, they can rejuvenate new growth of bone and repair itself. And there's a good example. Sometimes when you're out there uh, looking for your uh, deer sheds, uh, you come upon bones like this particular femur bone. I found this. There was a, a dead deer there and I did a little uh, forensic looking around there and the back femur apparently had got shot in the hunting season and uh, blew it apart and it would have bled from the femur artery and they, the hunter apparently didn't find it because the head and the rack was still with it. Now um, we'll move along here a little bit now. So just keep in mind the seventh and the third and while we're on that, uh, while we're on that topic and I know this is going to get some of you really hopping mad and I'm not going to promote one way or the other. Some of these new expandable broadheads they tucked out that they opened up to two inches that's what this one does I don't even know the name of it. Opens up two inches it's hitting a whole lot of bone friends a whole lot of bone and as it hits that bone it's going to take a lot of kinetic energy to break those bones because now it's got to break two bones just to get penetration into there. Uh, I know a lot of you swear by the modern day technology, but I'm just trying to point out something on the white-tailed deer. You're going to hit a lot of bones when that expands. Now, the traditional head, three to one, that was in Africa, was rated the best penetrating head. Fred Bear, this is similar to the late Fred Bear's razor head. And you notice it can go right between them bones. Even if it goes this way, it's still getting good penetration and it'll probably break the minimum, the minimal amount of bones. This has to break, the, the expandable two inches has to break the maximum amount before it gets the head into the lung area. So, you know, just something to ponder when you get in those arguments what, what's over the best. And I know what I'm going to shoot and I'm just trying to show you something and whatever you shoot your preference, you know. But uh, just show, showing you a little lesson on that. And I'll show you a little bit better example here in a minute. Okay. The rear of the deer also comes into play. And I don't know if I can get this up here. Anyhow, I guess I can. This is the rear hindquarter of the deer. That has the femur artery in it. This femur artery carries the blood from the heart that's it's expelled out the left side of the heart all the way through this would be the main artery it comes all the way through and comes back down now you have two arteries the one going back with blood and the one coming back blue is blood that needs oxygen unoxygenated blood they flow back into the heart the femur artery if it's cut 
the animal will die instantaneously also. This, this picture right here, I can get this off, walk around. This picture was an actual field photo of that deer. That was standing on a bean field 200 yards away from where I shot the deer. It looked like a uh, road cone standing out there. It was just bright red. I took and sawed the limb off and I had to repaint this as similar to what the actual blood was because this faded out. But that's, I mean, a blind man could have seen that trail. And what it did is when it, when it cut that, that's just like shooting it in the heart, but a little farther back. Now, the other interesting thing about that was this is the other side. This is the left side, the exit hole, where it passed by the brush and left as it smeared by. This would have been the entry side. And the ironic thing about it is, if you look at this cut on this bone right here, this is where the broadhead just went in, on, would have been on the right side. It looks like you were shooting this way, but I was not. I was shooting from this direction, and what had happened on the right side to get that mark going this direction, the deer went down, and when it went down, the broadhead went through this side and over the top of that femur artery. But that's why the hunt never ends. Pull these animals apart. There's very, it's just loaded with educational information. And you'll be a better hunter because you know what you're talking about and how that deer succumbed to death. Like I say, this was the right uh, rear femur, and it, it, it would have been in, in an upright position like, like this. And uh, as it went down, as the broadhead came here, that's how that cut got on, on the front side of it. This would be the back side, this would be the front side. But when it did that, these did do it in unison. It went under this one, cut that one. The blood was all over on the, on the, beyond the left side of the animal. Very interesting things to do. Just don't cut and gut and get on your Facebook or your uh, smartphone and start Googling that I'm a hero, da 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 da. And there's a whole lot that you can learn from the, each and every animal that you take with a bow and arrow. But uh, uh, by, while we're on top of that subject, I killed this particular deer, and as you can see the, in this picture, on this picture here, this is how many pieces when that 160 grain thunderhead hit that bone, that femur bone, it splattered it. I mean, I taped it all back together. Here was the actual impact on it. It was four below zero that day at one o'clock in the afternoon, and you sort of lose your dexterity at that temperature, and it took me two days to follow up on this deer. I, the second day I went to look for it, I was thinking I was looking for a dead deer. It got up and uh, 10 yards in front of me, and I was like a Elmer Fudd. I didn't have an arrow red or anything, and the deer took off. I had to come back the next day. The deer was still alive, and it was bleeding out internally. No blood on the ground, very little blood. And when I came up on it this time, it was 4.30 in the afternoon. The sun was in my face. And I made it a shot as fast as I could. I got it in the guts, but that, the deer was so weakened that helped finish it off. But when I put the knife to that, this would have been uh, the, the right ham. The, the right ham was like huge because the whole uh, amount of blood that it lost out of the circulatory system went into that rear quarter. And when I put the knife to it, it just blew up with all the pressure that was in it. But uh, this bone was like 13 pieces when it split it. If you get your femur hurt, broke when you break your leg, uh, that can happen to you also because it can it break that femur bone. No, just things to keep in mind and things to learn when you when you do you know when you do your field dressing. Keep looking for things like that. Uh, here was another humerus bone. I shot this deer. I missed it. On January 1st of 2006, a week later, it came down the same trail, but it didn't go through the, the path that I shot at. It, it came closer to the tree stand, and when I shot it, as it went by, you would have thought, as you can see, you, you, would, you would have swore that it uh, came down from this direction. 
but it didn't. As the deer went down, as it, it exited out that leg, that far leg, and, and the arrow was coming this way. But if you stand it back up, you just swore it was coming the other way. But it was because it went down and crossed it out, cross going the bone going that way. And that's the broadhead cut that I put in there, highlighted in that red. So there's just several things that you can do once you've harvested your deer by looking at these bones and learning and self-educating yourself through uh, countless hours of research and readings. So, uh, like I say, it, uh, it just amazes me what you can learn from this stuff just by taking the time to go ahead and uh, pulling your deer completely apart, bleaching the bones out, basically boiling them out and putting them back together. All right. The next one we're going to talk about is the bear. The bear is really unique. It, it's different than the white-tailed deer and, and most uh, hooven animals because it has an extra stress, a truss in its uh, shoulder blade. There's a lot of muscle on that shoulder blade. That's why it's, these are almost impenetrable where you can get it through the, the normal deer or antelope type scapula. For the bear, you can see that extra truss in there for strength. Plus the whole anatomy of its radius and everything is just like a human. It has a wrist, the fingers are more dexterity, and that's really another reason with the movement of this wrist bone, which uh, the deer ha cannot twist their body like what a bear can. They can do all kinds of stuff when they're on the ground and get, get really distorts that aiming spot because of their ability to twist their foreleg with that wrist action and their fingers have the same joints as what we have that gives them the climbing ability and they're really a unique animal but you, like I said you can definitely see the difference in the scapula formation a bear has this truss and this truss in it where the deer only has one uh, truss going for it that makes this really really strong there again I don't care much what you shoot, but if you were going to try to shoot and you got a two inch expandable head, you're going to hit a lot of bone. You're going to get marginable with basically nail penetration. Where if you go with a traditional head, it's going to have one slice cutting from the point uh, impact and it's tapered back small enough to an inch. Therefore, you may split that and get on in. Now, that's questionable, you know, if it does. I know people have wounded a lot with this the traditional type head, but I know one thing with this head, it ain't happening. It's, and when I say it's not happening, it's, uh, uh, I'm searching for the word and I can't, it's physics. The wider it is, the more, the more bone it's going to hit, which is putting the, more of the brakes on. Because the more bone it hits, it takes more kinetic energy. And once you loosen that arrow from the string, it's already starting to decline in kinetic energy. So when you hit that bone, it'll gobble a lot of kinetic energy up in a hurry just trying to penetrate it. And the wider the surface you have, you're going to lose kinetic energy just that much faster. And then, like I say, that's just physics, simple physics. You don't go to the garden. You know, that's why a spade, you know, the garden spade, has one one blade on it you push it down you put two blades on it you're going to have to jump higher and come down harder you put three blades on it you're going to have to get the uh the fat lady that sings at the end of the song to jump down on that because you're going to have to have more weight the more blades you put on it the more weight you're going to have to drive it that's why simple physics a spade a garden spade one edge goes right on down through same way with an axe <laughs> you don't have a four-bladed axe unless you're trying to split wood or something but if you're trying to cut wood <coughs> you want the minimal amount of cutting surface to make the most penetration okay these two bones back here as we're looking back here this bone right here was an 1800 pound bison American bison huge huge scapula there's probably close to 175 pounds 
of muscle, probably even 200 pounds of muscle encapsulating that bone. It ain't happening. If you shoot it in that bone, it's going to go have to go through almost six to eight inches of flesh just to get to that bone. So picking an aiming spot on a buffalo is quite different because they have the big hump and you actually have to shoot a lot lower than you would think because you get this impression of the hump is up there but the aiming spot's way down there. Now this next bone, just to show the contrast, this little bone here is the smallest one I have and this is of a uh, pronghorn antelope which is um, the fastest animal on North America continent. And in contrast, I mean it is a whole lot smaller than the bison. Another unique thing about the pronghorn antelope, uh, the white-tailed deer have dew claws uh, coming off of a tuft. The pronghorn animal has no dew claws. And the reason that it doesn't want to catch trash and stuff like that in it. The hoof on the American pronghorn is cushioned. It has a cushion built in to it to where it can absorb that uh, shock. Uh, because, you know, in a horse race, they always keep uh, the track collivated so when the horses are uh, running, the radius bone doesn't blow out on them because that pounding. And, well, the antelope don't have that feature, unfortunately. If that ground out there in Wyoming or any western state, it's as hard as a rock. And if you ever try to dig a pit blind, you'll think it's harder than a rock. So they take a lot of absorption. That's where that scapula hooked on with the, with the cartilage that is absorbing a lot of, that's the shock absorber. But also they have a, a uh, built-in cushion in their hoof, their self, without dew claws. Now, with that said, that bison bone, and we can move it up here, I think. Try to get it up here a little closer so you can get more comparison. I have to put this antelope foreleg on a table of probably three feet high just to get the height of this bison bone to make them compatible. This is a huge humerus compared to this. <clears throat> Here's something you're going to learn. This carries a lot of weight, a lot of weight, but, and I'm going to uh, quote this from this book so you'll know I'm not talking uh, bull. C.E. Thomas, professor of engineering materials at Oregon State College, set out to test the relativity strength of leg bones of large animals compared to the pronghorn. He rigged an apparatus that would uh, uh, accommodate increasing pressure, strapped the foreleg, which would be one of these up in here, the humerus or the radius, strapped it down, and uh, Begin to apply pressure, piling on the pounds. Which one of these do you think broke first? This massive bone or this small bone? I'll answer because we don't have that much time. At 41,300 pounds <coughs> per square inch, the buffalo the bison bone gave out. At 41,300 pounds per square inch. The antelope leg, on the other hand, held out for another 4,000 pounds. That would be, if you added that 4,000, that would be 45,300 pounds of pressure to break this smaller bone. This is some of the strongest bone known to mankind in the animal world because it runs somewhere close to 60 miles an hour on hardened ground. If it didn't have that kind of tensile strength, they would be breaking their legs every time they went on that 60 mile an hour sprint and on that hard ground. Even though they got the cushion of the scapula and the soft hoof with the pad built into it. it was, and at 100 pounds, Believe you me, when 100 pounds is going 60 miles an hour, it's putting some stress on those humerus and radius bones, uh, enough that they would snap. 
but they can go up to 45,300 pounds compared to 41,300 pounds on the, on the bison. That's just, that's, I don't know if you knew that, but that's why I enjoy bringing this information to you. And I also enjoy showing you that it's just not my opinion. It's uh, documented by higher authorities than myself. Okay, that's enough for those two bones. We'll move these back over here, get them out of the way. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am giving it to you because um, it's just uh, a nice thing to do. Now, you remember when I showed you the deer heart? Big game animals compared to deer. This was the bison's heart. This was your Iowa, probably a 250 pound live weight buck deer compared to a 2,000 pound, 1,800, 2,000 pound bison. So as you can see, that's quite a bit larger and uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. This back skeletal area is that of a Canadian bull moose of this size. Uh, it came from this moose right here. And you notice, if you can see on uh, how it, high the hump is up there, where the black hair is going through the ceiling of my house, that's what I call the fish fin. That would be where your tenderloin is. But somebody asked me, well, how big is a tenderloin in a, in a moose? Ladies and gentlemen, when you get shoot a moose, you get nine feet of tenderloin. Uh, four and a half feet one way, four and a half feet the other way. That's a huge amount of tenderloin. You notice from this aiming point to how much bigger the aiming point is on the thoracic cavity of the moose. And you have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten rib bones on the moose. So if you came into the center of that would be one, two, three, four, five. That's where the bullseye is. If, you, if you're three and a half inches up, three and a half inches down, actually you can expand that because it's bigger. <coughs> because you have bigger organs in there. Now, this is the moose's heart. And it lays right in here, right down at the bottom, up, up toward the front. But you can notice, you want to make sure you shoot a little farther back. <coughs> because this is also encapsulated with another 150 pounds of, of muscle on that front of it. But this, this is the moose, and if you look real careful at that moose, you'll see a muzzy three blade 100 grain <coughs> broadhead hole in there. Came, started there, came out there. Shot that moose at a mere 15 yards out of a tree stand. But, uh, this is what gets a lot of people in trouble most first time moose hunters will shoot under the moose. Simple fact. If you put this skeleton up against that one and you're acclimated to judging yardage on a white-tailed deer at about 36 inches, maybe 40 at the most, at 40 yards it's going to look far away. So you're going to know right off the bat that it's far away. But being the thoracic cavity in the moose starts clear up here, it has down here, it's got a lot of body hair, that's one of the problems that happens. Because most people that shoot at their first moose may see it standing at 40 yards, and it'll look, well, you can see the difference in it, they'll look so much closer that you'll assume it's a 20 yard chip shot and you'll go right underneath of it. Very seldom do they go over more shots than, than you want to know about go under because of the size and they look closer but yet they're farther. So what you want to do is go out if you're going to go on a uh, big game hunt you stop looking at the white-tailed deer which is way down here no more than waist high go out go to a zoo Go out to a farmyard, start looking at uh, farm cattle. They're not quite as tall as the moose, 
but that will give you a better acclimation of judging yardage. That way you won't be shooting underneath of them because those are huge. Now, with that said, here we're back to this uh, broadhead selection on big game animals. As you notice, these bones are quite big. And if I put that up there, that's uh, about two and a quarter, two, two, two. If you take, and this is just my opinion, but it's physics also. So, I mean, you can, I'm not even going to make the argument. I'm just going to tell you what you can be in for. If you take an expandable broadhead, you're going to be hitting so much of these big bones trying to get in there, there's no way that'll go through there. That's two inches wide. Right there. From, that's exactly two inches. You put your, your, when that's coming back there, where that's cutting at, you're getting two inches of expansion. And as that expands on an animal this big, you're still hitting pure bone. If you get lucky and it goes through vertical instead of horizontal, fine, you get in there. But with that said, to traditional three inch long, one inch wide, cut on impact, will go through there any, and if it, do, if it hits a bone, it's going to glance off. This is one of the ultimate, even though I've shot a lot of moose with a hundred grain muzzy, it sounds small, but once you get into that thoracic cavity, it punctures it. But I, I and a personal friend of mine up in Nipigon, Canada, we, we've done a lot of custom of these, and he has, because I know it advertises that the ultimate this and ultimate that, but if you're an outfitter and somebody shows up to camp with one of these, uh, you got questions, because they know the anatomy, that you were using it on this side of an animal down in the cornfields of Iowa, not on this side of the animal up in the Boreal Forest. There again, you can get it through there, but why, why risk it? Go with something that's proven, where it's the traditional 3 to 1 or a smaller broadhead. Like I said, that heart that I showed you, I shot that right through there with a 100 grain muzzy and it penetrated both lungs and killed it instantaneously. So uh, that's just some things that, you know, to think about. Okay, what you're about to see, you ain't never going to see nowhere. And I, I guarantee you, you're not going to see it on the outdoor channel, or you may after I show it to you. But those people are so entwined in the high fives and uh, uh, pushing product that they forget they're supposed to be teaching you and me. If I watch it, I don't watch it. Not that I know it all. I'm just fed up with it. But they're supposed to be teaching you something other than uh, how to hunt on a well-managed property. And that's why most people, uh, videos now are made of white-tailed deer. If you try to make that same kind of video hunting moose or bigger animals in a burrow forest, you're not going to have near that success rate. You're going to take you years to get one of them footage, not days. Okay, without bashing, here we, here we go. I shot that deer in 2010 on November 30th. It has eight and a half inch brow times. It ended up scoring 100 at... Uh, Final score was 144 typical. It was almost 150 before it had some deductions on it. Heavy, heavy mass. That deer was the most unluckiest deer, and I was the most luckiest deer that day that ever going to be. And I'm going to tell you the rest of the story, and I'm going to show you the story. All right. Remember when I told you the seventh and third rib? There's the seventh, there's the third. These are the actual lungs out of that deer. Okay, we're going to inflate these actual lungs out of that deer. This deer was shot at 34 yards on the last, well, the 30th of November. Get, bear with me here. swelling up in there and I'm going to take them out and show you something here in a second. They would go on up but I, I, I'm not being able to get enough 
tension on the hose, but the, air, the lungs are still intact. So here's what I want to show you. Yeah, I've attained a small leak in these lungs. They're five years old. That's what super glue was for, made for. In the field, in the military, they saved many soldiers' lives with super glue by squirting it into the wound and putting it on your skin, putting compression on it, and that would help seal the wound. Now, like I say, these, these lungs, they've been blown up several times, and I noticed the freezing and thawing. Uh, they've created a little more seepage in there, and I'm going to show you, I'll, I'll let that set up there for a second, and uh, we'll get right with it. Well, we've let that super glue dry a little bit, and it, Here's what I want to show you. Those lungs are perfectly good. There's nothing wrong with the lungs whatsoever in that deer. 34 yard shot. There's no hole in them. Nowhere. Other than the hole that we just repaired with super glue. This was the actual broadhead. 100 grain muzzy. Broke part of the blade off. It went through this really heavy bone structure down here. I can wiggle it in here. Trying to reenact getting it back down through there. It went through there and wedged into the far rib and, and went out. Now, you gotta ask yourself something. Here's your two inch expandable. 34 yards away. Ladies and gentlemen, need I say more? On that shot, look at all the bone in, that you would have had to have penetrated in that brisket to even get into that th thoracic cavity. A lot. It's your decision. I don't care what you shoot. I mean, because you're not going to buy in. Most people have already got their minds made up one way or the other. So I really don't want to have a bunch of feedback. I shoot this, I shoot that. This is not what this is about. I don't care what you shoot. I'm just showing you the pluses and the minuses. It, uh, you're not going to change my mind one bit, and I'm not going to change your mind. So I hope you get something more out of it than a mechanical versus, you know, uh, replaceable. Because that's not what I want to get across here. If you look at this heart right there as it laid on the bottom the broadhead sliced there, there there's the width of it right there three three blade muzzy made the passage took it out at 34 yards after it broke all that heavy bone to make that penetration. Because remember I told you the third the third and the seventh and right there you, you would be one, two, three, four. That came through the fourth one that way or one, two. If you go back that way it would be the, the sixth. But it was still in that margin of error. And it took the heart out of that deer and I want to show you one more time the lungs have no hole in them. One more time, I'll blow these lungs up. Now keep in mind, these are five-year-old lungs, and they did have a life to them, and they're not quite as inflatable as they used to be, but you'll still get the gist of it. Remember, see where the cut was on the heart? Beautiful set of lungs, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely nothing wrong with them. This little damage done here is just through age, but there's no holes in them at all. That deer was so close to living and me so close to missing it wasn't funny but I really hope that you learned something from this illustration and like I said I'm not a, against expandables I'm not for them I just don't use them now I mean and I also said this is not a uh, promotion of promoting one broadhead over the other. I'm just showing some of the factors. Now some guy's going to say well, if I was shooting expandable at 34 yards it would have hit up there. But even so, you'd still hit a whole lot of bone.
to get through there. And at 34 yards, you'd have been losing kinetic energy fast, and then you would have still, had, even at a good shot, you'd have still had to hit a lot of bone. Where if you hit it with the with the single one or the muzzy three blade, it goes right through the area, right through, right through, right through. Very little bone interference whatsoever. But keep this in mind. I am not. In favor for this and I'm not against it because you as the hunter have a right to choose whatever you're going to hunt with and this old man uh, ain't going to persuade you in five minutes to go one away I just wanted to educate you a little more where so few on what you watch on TV do not so there's one more thing I want to go over and this was interesting it's vinegar Sometimes when I get these specimens, they get a little rank. That's what happened to my bear skeleton. It was pretty smelly in August. So what I had to do is I dumped vinegar in there. That's the butcher's trick. You know, if you gut shot an animal, you put vinegar on a rag and you wipe the inside out and that'll kill that enzyme and get that stench out of there. And vinegar, this is the number one use to get you know, to preserve your meat inside an animal if you've got gut intestine fluid and stuff in them. Well, I put this this bottle and another, so, you know, I had quite a bit. This is a, uh, what, what is this, 128 ounces, you know, probably a gallon. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's a gallon of vinegar. I put two gallons in, the, in, in a cooler and put it out back. Didn't think nothing of it. You read on that little print there, it says 5% acid. I go out to get that cadaver in uh, late March, and I popped the lid off, and it was pretty rank. And all it was was slurry. Vinegar with 5% acid, two gallons, ate every bone and every piece of meat with that acid in it and just reduced it you could pour the bear out of the cooler that was something I had no concept that would happen so watch some of this stuff even as innocent as it sounds five percent that will still do the job so I hope you enjoyed that little education thing uh, that's the history of that buck he uh, <laughs> he was so close to carrying living on another day and I was so lucky so that's it from my basement to, to your living room and uh, that's why they call me the non-typical Norwalkian <laughs>